Hi, welcome. In this video, I want to tell you a little bit about a project that I'm planning to embark on for 2024. And I am probably going to be sharing a lot of videos and written content from that project. And I thought it would be just fun to make a video, first of all, introducing myself, uh, giving some background into both the way I'm going to go about this, the way I'm thinking about it, the potentials it has for kind of becoming maybe a larger project involving more people. Um, also my own background and interest in the topic. So um, this is going to be jumping all over the place. Hopefully it'll be somewhat interesting to you. Um, so first of all, Stian Hoklev, my name, uh, living in a small town in Norway, working on an amazing tool called Tana. And I've always been interested in learning, but also self-organized learning, both individual and uh, collaborative um, using groups and networks. Um, so going all the way back to 2007, I was in a undergrad program at the University of Toronto in Canada. And the field of kind of open content, creative commons licensing, uh, peer produced content online, um, and open educational resources was just kind of beginning to happen, uh, lots of excitement. Uh, and um, there was this amazing course, um, one of the very first of its kind. Uh, it was about open education uh, taught by a university professor as a graduate course. And he thought, what if I open this course to the world? Um, and at that point, nobody knew what that meant because there had been already a lot of experiments with sharing course content like PDFs, slides and so on. But what does it mean to actually do a course online? And as you can see, this is 15 years ago. So the technology was completely different. Um, and the way he uh, decided to do it was to um, do it in a very distributed fashion. This was back when a lot of people still had their own blogs that they were self-hosting. There were RSS feeds. Um, and so he said, hey, here's the curriculum. Here's the syllabus. There's a lot of readings. There are some reflection questions each week. And set up your own blog on your own website. And just let me know and I'll subscribe. We'll have a river of news that everyone can read. Uh, maybe I'll summarize something once a week. But it's all asynchronous. There was no uh, video meeting. Um, and, you know, the first question was read 150 pages of this United Nations report and answer a few questions. And even though I was in my last year of my undergrad, had a lot of coursework, and this was completely not for credit, um, I ended up spending one Sunday a week for a semester on this. I found it incredibly interesting to be learning together with other people. Um, you know, a lot of these were, were librarians, professors, people. Um, who were just really interested in the topic and brought a lot of their own perspectives to it. So this was my first exposure to this incredible new way of learning in a structured and community fashion, but also self-organized. And uh, the fact that you had to host it yourself, of course, was a bit of a technical hurdle, but uh, it had two huge advantages to, compared to a lot of the course platforms we have today. One is that I still have everything I wrote because I hosted it on my own blog. It's actually been migrated a few times since then, but I still have everything I wrote, um, which is not true about any of the master courses I took on the course platform at our university or many things I've done since then. Uh, the other thing is because um, people would be following each other. This was actually an incredible way of bootstrapping a community. Um, you basically came out of this course knowing that there were 20, 30 people who would be reading your blog, who would be subscribed to your blog. Um, and that was super motivating for me in terms of keeping, continuing writing. Um, so this was um, really fundamental to me. Um, soon after uh, this course, there was, and this is not, this is a later iteration, but um, the actual original Massive Open Online courses or MOOCs came out and they were extremely different from what you know from um, Udacity and edX and, 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 and Coursera. Um, it was a massive 
um, well, as the name says, it wasn't a hundred thousand. It was, you know, a few thousand, but that's still massive for a course. And it was also self-organized and it was even much more um, fragmented and kind of net complex network topology than the first one. Because in the first one, there were 25 people and we basically read everyone's submissions every week. In the second one, there were a few thousand people and they intentionally wanted this to be a uh, kind of landscape of different communities. So what the two people who organized this did, and these were two academics from Canada, um, they had a curriculum, a red thread, some guiding questions, some resources every week. And then they asked people to self-organize, not just by setting up their own blog, but by founding their own communities. And so you would have, this was about an educational theory, and you would have Spanish educators meeting in Second Life, back when that was still a thing, uh, discussing in Spanish about the topic. You would have people uh, meeting up in person in certain cities. Um, you would have people setting up mailing lists, maybe physics teachers wanting to discuss um, about their particular topic. And uh, then the key thing was, you know, can we both have these incredibly specific discussions happening in media where people are comfortable, but are there also ways in which like the best ideas or the most interesting questions or the most you know, useful resources can bubble up um, from these grassroots groups and up to maybe the, the course organizers who can spread it to everyone or a, jump across to another group that might be interested in it. And uh, this to me was, was a real revelation and it informed a lot of the work that I was going to do as a researcher. Um, I got involved uh, in something called a peer-to-peer -peer university uh, where we try to take this, you know, kind of the best of both of those worlds and, and create a platform where we could help anyone set up and run these kind of peer-led courses and do experimentation around how this kind of learning happens, how we can foster it, what kind of software support you need, what kind of social support you need. Um, that was an incredible a uh, few years. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer university is, is continuing today. Uh, they've kind of switched gears a little bit, focusing more on in-person learning groups supported by libraries. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm just mentioning this here now. Um, I'm still amazed that there was so much interest around these kind of um, grassroots and peer-based learning initiatives, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And it feels like today with the technology that we have, the video conferencing, the, the AI, but um, the kind of collaborative writing, all those things. Um, I don't feel like there's been much progress. In fact, I feel like there's a lot less available today, unless I'm missing something big. Uh, but there are some, some exceptions. The Catherine Project is a fantastic uh, project that offers free courses on the classics and classical languages. Um, so this was a very long introduction and I haven't even really gotten to, to the core, but you know, I wanted to share this with you because it's a very important part of, of how I think about learning, both as an individual and, um, and as a group. Uh, later, I went on to do my PhD thesis uh, designing a uh, massive open online course, which was aiming to kind of bridge some of these gaps between the small group uh, intimate uh, collaboration and the kind of distributed, overwhelming, drinking from the fire hose, super exciting, but super overwhelming um, approach to learning. Uh, so I, I designed that and I also um, researched that for a while afterwards. Um, but then I left academia. I started working on um, different IT startups, all having to do with uh, learning information management, knowledge management. Um, and as I was working, um, as I got into Rome research, uh, which was uh, my first kind of taste of uh, tools for thought, although I'd been experimenting uh, a lot with it as a PhD student without ever knowing what it was called and, um, you know, the kind of heritage that it had. Um, but Rome for me was, was amazing, both the tool and the community. And one of the things I found through the community was um, this Awakening from the Meaning Crisis lecture series um, it, by a Canadian professor, John Ravakey. This is an incredible synthesis of um, basically the history of the world from um, 60,000 years ago, 
um, going through a lot of different civilizations, religions, um, spiritual practices, but mixing that with things like neuroscience, modern psychology, um, and really pulling things together in a way that I had never seen done before and which suddenly made me much more interested in things like ancient philosophy. Um, because I did take a course in philosophy in high school uh, where we focused um, on Plato for quite a while and I read some, I read The Republic, uh, but I had zero context about the Greek society, about you know, what context Plato was writ writing this in, what he was reacting to, um, how it was interpreted at that time, and, and of course also how it has informed kind of all of philosophy since then. Uh, and so to me it was kind of interesting, but also very disconnected. And in fact, that is kind of the theme of this. Um, I've never been super interested in history as one of my main topics. Um, and if history, I would say I would have been mostly interested in 19th and 20th century history um, because I'm very interested in politics. I'm interested in society. I want to understand, you know, the different ideologies, communism, capitalism. Um, how do, why do we have differences in the world? How do democracies function? Um, how did Europe end up being the way it is today? Um, so I, I know a fair amount about that, but going further behind, it's, and I don't know if this is partially due to how history is taught in schools in Norway, where I grew up, but I feel like I have fragments of so much stuff, right? I have Vikings and I have Roman Empire and the Egyptians, and I spent a lot of time in China, so I know something about Chinese history, but that's almost completely disconnected from what happened anywhere else. Um, there's the French Revolution, there's, you know, Descartes, there's John Mills, Stuart Mills. I mean, tons of fragments. I've seen documentaries, I've seen, I've read novels, historic, historical novels, I've read, you know, biographies about some of these people. Um, I've even read some of these macro history books, um, like Sapiens, um, which I took a lot of notes about. Um, let's see, so here are my notes about Sapiens. So I was in a book club, uh, kind of, and I was, I was taking very, very detailed notes um, about that. Um, I remember a long time ago, I was reading Guns, Germs, and Steel, right? So these books that, you know, I've been interested in reading, reading David Graeber's new book. But the problem is that without a kind of general understanding about history, um, everything is new to me. So I know that there's all been a lot of critique of Sapiens. I actually captured a bunch of it here to kind of read later. And my problem when reading Sapiens was I didn't quite understand what specific narrative or point uh, Yuval Noah Harari was making that might be controversial because to me, so much of the information was new. Um, I was taking notes about human migration, about you know the introduction of money, the introduction of writing. To me, that was new information or information that I didn't have a good grasp of before. And I thought, this is great. Um, and if I had had that grasp before, I might have been able to read these kind of books and notice that, oh, he is telling the story in this kind of a way. He is biasing certain things. He is making certain connections, certain assumptions, privileging a certain narrative. And I could engage with that in a way that would be quite interesting. Um, but without that, that kind of overview, I, I'm not able to do that. And I feel like if I just kept reading macro history books, I would never really get that overview um, by itself. So um, we're here, we have this interest in a lot of things, in learning, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, I'm getting interested in ancient philosophy or you know, seeing that the way that, that John Verveke explained Plato and Socrates and, and so on, um, and, and the kind of the age that they lived in and, and the transition was something that resonated with me, that kind of awakened me 
but I wasn't ready to just go and read Plato after that. Um, I was reading some of these history books um, and really what, uh, here's by the way, uh, yeah, I had a short-lived new newsletter that I might uh, reawaken sometime uh, where I wrote about how I was listening to um, the John Rovecki and, and taking notes and stuff like that. Of course, I have um, lots of notes about the podcast as well, lots of detailed notes here. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the situation. And what changed all of this um, in quite a significant way was visiting Greece for the first time. And it's funny because Norwegians love Greece. And I feel like I'm probably the last Norwegian to go to Greece. And most people obviously go there, stay at the hotel for two weeks and so on. Um, and we went there not primarily as a, as a history excursion, primarily as, you know, exploring the island of Crete. Uh, but we did visit a few places. And one of them, uh, the first one actually was Heraklion, uh, the capital. And just walking around there, getting a sense for this place. And we came across this um, massive uh, fortress. Like, I mean, the walls are several meters thick. And I had no context. Like, I knew very little about Greece. I didn't even know the geography. I knew kind of where it was on the map, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you where Athens was. I knew very little about the history. Um, I did not know anything about Crete. So, you know, this was all new to me. I'm walking in there and of course there's a lot of informational posters. Um, and so one of them is telling me that this place was uh, actually the site of the second longest um, siege in the world. So it was besieged by the Ottomans for 30 years when it was held by the Venetians. And so right away I'm thinking, huh, I lived in Italy for two years. I've been to Venice a bunch of times. I knew Venice was very important in kind of world trade, but I never knew that Venice had colonies. So that's the first thing which is kind of shocking to me. Um, and, and then I started to imagine like, wow, what, what would it be like to live inside this fortress for 30 years as you're being besieged? Like, I, I wonder if there's some good historical novels about that because it's, it's crazy. Um, but then they're talking about the, you know, before, um, before this, it was part of the Byzantine Empire. And it just struck me, I had heard those words before, but I literally could not tell you anything about them. Like Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, does that have something to do with Rome or not? At what time was it? What was the... And I just stood there and I felt incredibly stupid. Um, and I'm saying this with all honesty, I have always thought about myself as a, as a fairly informed person, someone who's good at school, who's very interested in reading, who is paying attention, is learning. And although I ha have never focused on, on older history, but still, I just felt so, I was like, what, how is it possible to be 42 years old and not know these things? Um, so that was the first thing that happened in Crete. But the second thing is, and I should mention that I've always been very interested in learning languages. I've been pretty good at it. I speak quite a lot of languages. And uh, yet I've never really been interested in Greece, uh, Greek, sorry. But the combination of being kind of more interested in ancient philosophy now that um, due to the Awakening podcast, and just being there for two weeks, and I'm not the person who can lie at the beach um, without having anything to do. So, you know, every time I see a sign in a language I don't understand, I want to try to understand, even learn the alphabet. So I bought some books and um, started learning. Um, I really didn't interact with anyone while I was there. I barely learned alphabet. But when I came home, um, I did really like the idea of, you know, could I actually learn this language that has this incredible history? Um, and I started using uh, Duolingo and then reading books in parallel. So I'd get a Greek book and an English or a Norwegian book and read them in parallel. And I've been tweeting quite a lot about my different, um, different plans with learning Greek because um, this is actually what I'm, one of the things I'm doing right now. Um, 
modern Greek turned out to become a gateway drug to both ancient Greek and Latin, uh, which I was not planning on uh, at all. But as I was looking around for resources on, on modern Greek, uh, very naturally I came across all these really interesting communities that were you know, sharing, there were self-learners in ancient Greek, there were podcasts, there were actually much better pedagogical resources for learning ancient Greek than modern Greek. Um, and there is something incredibly fascinating about potentially being able to read Plato or, you know, some of these other um, classic plays uh, that, you know, because you also, as you learn this history, you realize how incredibly important these have been for all of culture in, in certainly in Europe um, for the next 2000 years. So I started learning. Uh, and then as you're hanging out with ancient Greek people, they all, a lot of them are learning Latin. There's even much more resources to learn Latin. Um, and so, yeah, now I've kind of been doing that for a while. Um, I'm able to kind of follow a, 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 a audiobook in, in modern Greek. I don't speak much. Um, I'm, I've worked through most of the first textbook in ancient Greek, um, and I'm almost done with the first Harry Potter in Latin. So that's kind of my, my status. Um, so as part of this interest in, uh, these languages, I read this book, Latin story of a world language, which was incredibly interesting, much more than I think you would think from the title. Uh, and uh, I, I actually want to really go back and, and take some more notes uh, as I read it. But through, you know, and he's focusing a lot on, on medieval Latin, so not just a ancient Latin. Um, and again, he was talking, for example, a lot about Charlemagne, a word that maybe I've heard once or twice, but I had no idea about his significance for European history at all. Um, and so the final piece of the puzzle, um, so as I've been interested in classics, I've been following uh, the Twitter feed of Antigone, which is an open, um, they call themselves a forum for classics. It's kind of a, a shared blog, um, of a lot of really, really good stuff. Uh, it's, it's probably most of the stuff in my readwise is from Antigone at this point. And they had this post here where they introduced a video series from BBC published in 1969, one of the very first shows that the BBC made in color, uh, back when David Attenborough was head of BBC. This is, I don't know, it's super fascinating to me. And this TV show, uh, which I've been watching um, several episodes of with my wife, it's on YouTube, um, is really interesting because it's a way of telling the medieval history of Europe, um, a lot of it focused on, on architecture, uh, music and visual arts in a way that, that makes sense, that is systematic, that is, you know, yeah, that gives you the context. Um, I, I lived in Italy for two years. I've been to more churches than I can count. I've seen a lot of beautiful stuff, but I've never had any kind of framework to make sense of it um, very much. So all of these things are kind of, you know, um, percolating. Um, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm kind of mostly focused, though, on, on the ancient world and also the Byzantine Empire. I get a really big interest in the Byzantine Empire once I figure out what it is. Um, and it feels like a very understudied, um, you know, important. Like the thing that the Roman Empire kind of continued a thousand years past what most people think is pretty mind blowing. Um, and so that has really been an eye opener as well. Um, so I'm almost to the point where I want to tell you kind of what I'm planning to do. Um, but I will say that, you know, I've been thinking throughout my whole life, I've been thinking a lot about learning, self learning, self organized learning. And um, there's a few things that I, you know, think are, are interesting to pursue. Uh, I mean, one in general is just obviously networks of people sharing publicly, which I'm trying to do here, which I've done, you know, whether I'm learning programming or I'm learning other things through blogs, through Twitter, um, through online courses, discussion forums, all of that stuff. Um, 
Then there's spaced repetition, which I think can be incredibly powerful. I mean, partially Michael Nielsen and certainly Andy Matushek, you know, kind of opened my eyes to how that can be used for so many more things than just um, vocab for language, which I actually never use it for pretty much. Um, and I've done some interesting experiences around that. Uh, and then there is this belief in a framework of organizing, because I think a big question is, you know, previously the question was, what is learning in the age of Google? Now the new question might be, what is learning in the age of AI? Um, but one of the things that I think Andy Matushak's and Michael Nielsen's work underscores, um, even though they focus on spaced repetition, is the role of memory. Um, the, just the fact that you can look something up isn't enough. I mean, for some things it is, but for a lot of things it's not, because you need to have internal structures in order to be able to process and interpret new information. Um, and you need to build those structures. And that's, of course, what formal education should do. I'm not convinced it always does a great job of it. Um, certainly not the primary education in Norway. But so for, you know, um, philosophy, I've been really interested in argumentation maps or graphs, how, ways of very using very structured methods to lay out arguments and, and whether that can really help you. But for history, um, I've been really wondering how you take good notes in history because it always seems so overwhelming. As I said, if I read Sapiens, I feel like I don't, you know, every, every sentence is new to me. I don't yet know what is important. And so I kind of feel like I need to write everything down, which of course isn't helpful. Um, but I've always had the thought that like a timeline, for example, if I only had some kind of an overview of a broad swath of history, um, that feels like it would help me do those, you know, details and, and have hooks to put them on. Um, and of course there's other things. There is, um, there are timelines, you know, there, there are some, some dimensions of history that, that, um, present themselves. Um, there is the timeline and of course you can have many different, uh, topics at the timeline. So you can have, you know, um, different countries, what was going on in the Byzantine empire while this thing was going on in Western Europe or in Norway or in China. Um, you can have different topics. Uh, what was going on in philosophy? What, you know, so as I said, I spent two years in Italy, but I wasn't in, in an international school. And while I was there, I visited a classical, uh, liceo classico for a week. And although it was, you know, I'm sure the teaching was very dry. The students there seemed to hate it. They were learning Latin and ancient Greek, which now I think is super exciting, but I don't think they were very excited about it. Um, but the thing that they told me that fascinated me incredibly much was that their three year, and this was a, 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 call, a high school, three year curriculum was basically synchronous across time, across all disciplines. So I don't know, let's say they started year thousand or I don't know, year zero or whatever. And they would basically, you know, go through history, ending, I guess, at the 20th century in, the, in their final year in every single discipline. So they would say, okay, 15th century, what's happening in visual arts? What's happening in music? What is happening in the political situation in Europe? Who are kings? What are battles being fought? You know, looking at sociology, how are people living? Looking at philosophy, what's being written? Like looking at literature. And to me, that was a dream. Like I just thought that would have been so much cool to be able to see across, um, you know, all of these, all of these things. Now, I'm actually not sure if I understood it correctly. And, and one of the things that would be interesting to, to do is, is to look more into how they actually do it. Maybe I can find um, textbooks or even curricula or something online to see how they do it. But, but this idea has, has stayed with me. So as I was in the holiday period, um, you know, I was thinking about these maps and there are some, some really interesting 
uh, attempts at visualizing history. So here's here's one that maybe I'll I'll try to order a copy of this. I think it's quite old, and I think it's probably problematic for many reasons. I mean, some of these are are very Western centric or you know Christian centric or whatever. But still, it gives you you know you just look at eight hundred and you're like Charlemagne and what's going on in in the Islamic world, what's going on in India, you know, what's going on in China. Already, this is I love this thing. I want a massive thing, a version of this on my wall, and there's there's many examples of these. Um, but I was I, so I was doing Christmas, and we were doing the the Christmas calendar, um, and I guess I was thinking about 2024. Um, and I'll say one more thing. While I was a academic, of course, being in university is fantastic because you are surrounded by learning. You're surrounded by smart people. Uh, you spend your time researching, um, but you also have a publication pressure. There's competition. And I often felt like um, a lot of things that I didn't learn were kind of too late. For example, psychology. I never really studied psychology, even though I was in education. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to get good enough at psychology to be able to publish in psychology within, in a few years. And I need to get a job as a professor. And so I just shouldn't read anything about psychology. I need to focus on my strengths. And after I left academia, there was a big relief um, and, and a different sense of, of time. Um, because I have a job that I love. I have you know, a, a good life. And the things I do in my spare time, I mean, if I started now and you told me learning ancient Greek, or learning the saxophone, which I'm doing as well, would take five years. The thing is, in five years, I'm going to be five years older anyway. Um, as long as I'm enjoying the process, there's absolutely no rush. Uh, and that can feel really freeing, I think, instead of reading a history book and kind of being overwhelmed by, oh my God, I have to remember everything. So my idea, here it comes, is basically what it says here, 12 centuries in 12 months. So I was, I was playing with, with this um, numbers and thinking, you know, so, so right now my incredibly superficial understanding is that the Western Roman Empire collapses, I think 400 and something. And then there's a few hundred years of chaos in Europe and not much happens. Again, very superficial. I'll, I'll get back to this. Um, whereas at the, the Byzantine Empire just kind of keeps going uh, on its side, but gets fairly isolated from, from the Western world, the Western part of Europe. And then end of 700s, start of 800s, there's Charlemagne who unites a large part of uh, what was the Roman Empire. And in some ways that can probably be seen as kind of the start of the Middle Ages. Um, at least, yeah, so that's, that's very superficial, but that's actually a lot more than I knew two years ago. That's the point here. So my thought was, if I started around that Charlemagne period and I did a century per month for an entire year, that would bring me up to the present time. And that seems doable. Now, my ambition, it's funny, I tweeted this and, and one of uh, my historian friends said, like, that's insane, like, I would... You know, if I, if I could do a century in, in a year, that would be a lot. But of course, his, his standards are completely different from mine. Because my minimal... And I still don't know how much time I'll, I'll, um, I will uh, be able to allot to this. But my kind of minimal, minimal goal is for each century, I want to have a kind of sense of what does the map look like? You know, and, and of course, if there are like big wars or big things happening, of, you know, in the middle of the century, then I, I want to know that as well. Um, who are the, you know, what's happening kind of very globally? If you want to summarize this, this century in five, five lines or a paragraph, what, what, what would you say, you know? Um, and if I only did that, and I should be able to do that with like an evening per century, Again, we're aiming extremely low here, but we're starting with zero. We're starting, if you said what happened in the 12th century to me today, I know nothing. Literally, literally nothing. I could guess at some things, but they might as well be in the 11th or the 13th or 14th. So we're starting at zero. If I ended the year with having like, yeah, I kind of 
know something about each century. I kind of know the big wars, the big, you know, changes of, of empires. I would be happy with that. That would be a start because this is something that can be repeated. Imagine if you had that and you also took some notes and, and, and stuff like that. You could do the next year and you could focus on a specific topic. You could go deeper. But I'm hoping that I'll have more time than that. And so I'm, you know, I want to try to find... Um, the good thing is I don't have to be comprehensive at all. Just a sampling is is perfectly fine. If I have that kind of global structure of how things fit in, um, you know, maybe I'll be interested in finding some interesting people that lived at that time. I mean, who, that can be um, politicians, but it can also be philosophers or, or church people or whatever. Maybe I'll read some something about them. Um, I would love to be able to find a piece of music from each century. I don't know how easy it is for the first ones, but that should be obviously much easier later. Um, li listening to a piece of music, um, finding some architecture, finding some visual art from that, that century. Um, I, one crazy idea is trying to find a small piece of Latin and Greek text from that century and actually trying to read it with, with translation because I'm, I'm not that good yet. But that would be kind of magical to me. I think. Um, and then I want to take notes in Tama. I have some ideas for, for tags I want to set up for searches, for using the date functionality and stuff like that. Um, I'll be sharing, I think, everything I do, um, both kind of, so this is a workspace and anyone who's using Tana, I can invite you to, to, to view it, uh, you know, with the full Tana functionality. And if you don't already use Tana, you can use it for free. Just go to the Slack and introduce yourself. Uh, but I'll also be using the publish functionality to make websites uh, with some of the stuff that I find. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to gather some interesting resources about each century. So, you know, this episode in this podcast, this documentary, and so on. And, uh, yeah, that's basically my personal plan. Uh, and, and I'm hoping to do this no matter what, and I'm, I'm planning to share as much as I can going forwards. And I'm sure I'll learn a lot, not just about history, but also about the way I do this. Um, but as I was thinking about this, um, and I'm, I'm going to round it off with this, uh, and this is where we kind of circle back to some of the things I said initially about learning, because this, to me, uniquely suits itself for collaborative learning um, or networked learning. Um, because there are a lot of interesting dimensions along which you can organize the knowledge, but there are also an infinite amount of possibilities for rabbit holes and, and bringing in personal skills and perspectives and stuff like that. So I'm just going to outline, you know, a few going from very simple to ridiculously ambitious. And then I think it depends on who, whoever is interested and what their interest is uh, to see what kind of comes out of this this year. And maybe in the future, I'll make do something more ambitious. Maybe not. Maybe someone will take this idea. Uh, it's, uh, it's free. So basically, I'm starting to do this. I'm sharing my resources. I'm inviting anyone else to do the same thing. I mean, you don't need my permission. To, <laughs> there's no curriculum other than like, what I just said. Actually, the way personally I'm going to organize it, I'm going to spend January getting up to the year 800 and primarily looking, and this is going to be very brief, but you know, very brief at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and then a brief glance at what were happening the last few hundred years, kind of what, what, with really the focus of like getting to the 800, where are we? How did we get there? What's the situation in Europe? And I'm probably going to primarily focus on Europe, uh, but I'm also interested in it's definitely the Byzantine Empire, Norway as some something that isn't maybe a big part of Europe initially, but that's where I am from, so that's interesting. And and maybe Northern Africa and, and, and the Middle East, the Near East, um, we'll see. Um, I'm not going to bring in China and stuff like that at this point. Um, so, so yeah, so anyone can follow along. They can, you know, if they, if they are using Tana and want to wanna publish publicly, we could, you know, create a workspace where we pull in stuff from the both people and using dates and stuff. That could be a super interesting experiment. Let me know if you're interested. Um, you can use any other platform. If, you're, if you publish something, I would love to see it. Um, 
And, and if you have an interest, if anyone wants to do a, a monthly meeting uh, or any kind of structured approach, or then you know, let me know, I'd, I'd be interested in discussing. But yeah, like you could imagine, this would also be amazing for, you know, there's been some Rome book clubs that were really cool. There's been some small attempts with Tana. I know there's an Obsidian book club. So if someone wanted to do that, that'd be amazing. Uh, um, and, and it would be super interesting if there were people who had, you know, let's say, you know, you have someone from Hungary that they can obviously read, they have a different background than me, the different interests, they can read, you know, sources in a different language. Um, if there was a way in which we could benefit from each other, where some of the stuff that they're doing, maybe even a group of people doing Hungary, where some of the questions or some of the insights could kind of bubble up and, and be connected, I think that would be, be super interesting. Um, then, of course, this could become something super big and organized, like one of the original uh, connectives MOOCs. That would be interesting, but a lot of, I guess, work to organize. Um, but my, my kind of crazy idea comes out of um, both, uh, as I was saying, the, the kind of... So, the, so the, the, the Christmas calendar, the Advent calendar, which is a big thing in Norway, what's interesting to me about that is that it's a time when the whole country kind of synchronizes around something. So, you know, we, my, my kid is in school, so they did a lot of things around the Christmas calendar there. They would open a, a box every day. They would light a candle. Uh, they would say some verses. We were lighting candles and saying verses at home. We're not religious, but, you know, we're, we're into the, the Christmas tradition in Norway. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Christmas calendar shows on TV that have one show per per day until week 24. There's like public lightings of, of Christmas trees and stuff. Um, and that combined with this other thing in Norway, which is slow television. So the Norwegian TV, although I've complained in other parts that I think they're not ambitious enough when it comes to like, you know, lecture series or really intellectual content. But they have some interesting um, experiments with slow TV where they're like, let's follow you know, um, this, this boat that goes along the Norwegian coast for three days in you know, live TV the whole time. And it was really interesting because, again, it was a way of synchronizing the nation. People were watching it and then every place the boat came, hundreds of people were waving and they were all on TV and it was kind of a national moment. So my kind of crazy idea was what if a country like Norway announced that it was going to do this as a national exercise for 2024, whatever year, right? Can you imagine if just, okay, it's now March, of course we're doing the, the, the year 1000 or the year 1100 or something. And imagine if my kid was actually learning about the year 1100 in school. I think actually kids, I mean, and starting very young and, and being older, like going through this cycle for a year would be incredibly beneficial. And there's so many ways of adapting it and focusing on different things, right? But imagine if, if he was learning about stuff from the 1100, 1100s in school and the national broadcaster, I mean, they don't have to change all of their programs. Maybe they, every week they have a few programs. They have a documentary. There's, you know, out of all of the stuff in the archive, they choose some stuff about 1100s. And uh, the newspaper has some articles about the 1100s. And I'm listening to podcasts about the 1100s. And like people that I meet on the street are like, oh yeah, like, did you hear about that like king in France or whatever? Um, I, I think this is never going to happen. It's kind of insanely ambitious. But it is a really fascinating idea. Um, and it's something that I think like the BBC, at least earlier, I think maybe now they're not ambitious enough but feels like something that they could have done that that would have been possible even without changing the school even if just a national broadcaster did this and they just said you know just like on national geographic they have like a shark month or something what if they just said yeah we're good to, we're just going to do this throughout the year you can follow along if you want to <sighs> that's it i think this probably is a ridiculously long video but i kind of wanted to at least capture the full range of my thinking initially in a single place for those who actually find that interesting. Um, and I guess I, for me, all that's left is to actually start doing this. Um, so again, in the month of January, I'm gonna focus on the collapse of the Western Roman Empire moving up until the time of Charlemagne 
and getting ready to start um, um, the year 800 in February. Today I went to the local library and I got a bunch of books. Of course, there's a massive amount of stuff online too, but it's cool to have books. Um, and so let's see, we have the history of Norway for, there, there's a bunch of uh, volumes of this, but this is the one that is for the right time period because I am really interested in how Norway is interacting with the rest of Europe. Um, and so I'm not gonna spend, you know, this is stuff I'm gonna skim. I, maybe I wanna figure out who the king is. Maybe I wanna find out if there's some interesting stories Again, like I'm not going to read all of these. I'm not going to write everything down. I'm not trying to learn everything. I'm really, you know, trying to build up a top down, like what are the most important things? And then if there's stuff that's interesting, you know, because I have a whole month, as long as I've done that, that top level stuff at an incredibly superficial level, I'm free to explore. I don't have any rush to move on. I'm free to explore, go deep. Maybe I'll spend like a full day digging deep on some obscure person or some funny event and that's totally fine and then you know maybe next year I'll do something else so the main thing is to have this structure here's um, the history of the world they've got lots of this you know nice pictures and stuff which is also also cool to kind of flip through um, there's a women's history of the world so I guess that'll be interesting to see if there's some cool women from from that period um, there is, and I might, you know, I'm not, I'm not, some of these books may be not that useful. I just grabbed a bunch of them. Here's another um, who, what, where of world history. And this one is pretty cool. This is kind of a timeline. Um, so this is a little bit like what I would actually, this, this is going to be super useful because it shows um, a bunch of different categories. Um, completely synchronously. So I can flip through this and see what was happening in the 800s. And then here's another world history. This also has a lot of volumes. And interestingly, they named the period 500 to 1000 religions marching, <laughs> which is uh, not what I would have guessed. Um, but I guess the growth of the Christian church is a big part of that story as well. So yeah, that is my plan. I obviously, you know, things that you decide to do over New Year's have a tendency not to happen. And maybe I'm taking a big risk by announcing this loudly, but it feels like the absolute minimum is not too much and I should be able to, to maintain it. Um, and we'll see how much more I, I do. Um, but hopefully this is interesting to someone and I'd love to hear any feedback or ideas as I go along. So that's it.